processes and resources. What is a process? What is a thread? How are processes and threads different? Well, a process is basically a program. What happens in the CPU is there is a program counter and there's some memory. And so what happens is the program gets loaded into memory and then the program counter tells the CPU which part of that memory is looking at, which process or which operation is going to do next. And so that process counter continuously moves through and then the CPU execute these commands. So each one of these programs that gets loaded into memory is a process. Within those processes, you might have different pieces of execution. And those different pieces of execution within the same process can be called threads. So if you have a process that has threads, what really happens is your process is running and your process switches between the different portions of the process to do different things. It's very common to have uh, some larger applications have multiple threads and even some of them are starting to have multiple processes. Games were pretty common to have multiple threads back in the day. They still have uh, multiple threads. Um, the idea is that maybe you want to have your audio uh, be one thread, your GUI be a different thread, and some of your game logic be a different thread. So your audio can continuously run and not have to wait for it to make other decisions about game logic while you're playing your game. And one of the big changes with uh, the Chrome web browser was they decided that there were too many problems with um, one tab would crash and take down the entire browser. So Chrome decided to break it out and have each tab be a separate process. They've changed it a bit since then, but originally that was the idea. So that if one crashed, that tab could crash and the rest of the tabs could stay live. So processes, when they crash, they can take down a lot. Um, threads, when they crash, well, sometimes things continue to run. Sometimes they don't. It depends on how they crash, what happened. If it crashes, the whole process goes down. If it somehow gets in an infinite loop, then that portion of the thread can just loop forever, and the rest of it might stay live, keep going. So... That's basically processes and threads and how they're different. So then what is a multi-core CPU? Well, there's this whole thing about Moore's Law where the uh, speed of CPUs doubles every certain number of months or years. And things kept getting faster and faster and faster. And then they ran into this problem. The problem was that when you get things small enough, it doesn't really work out so well. So they were making all these CPU pieces smaller and smaller and smaller. And when you have electricity going through a CPU, at some point the electricity jumps across and breaks things. So you have two wires right next to each other and there's a really high charge, then they'll create some kind of a lightning bolt thing, little electric, electricity charge between the two of them. And that can, de can destroy stuff. So what do you do? Well. Your electricity is basically watts, but your watts are either going to be amps or volts. So amps create heat and resistance and fun things like that. And volts, they create your arcing jump. So as you take your larger CPUs and you shrink them down, you have to worry about these volts jumping across. So what you do is you convert your volts into amps. So that's kind of nice. It means that you can go much stronger, but not have to worry about it jumping across. The problem is that then your CPU heats up more. So it's kind of a trade-off. If you have a higher number of amps, your CPU overheats. If you have a higher number of volts, the charge to jump across and destroy stuff inside of your CPU. So when I first got into computers, CPUs could handle something like 200 volts and then it got down to like 
50 volts and now it's probably even lower before they start causing problems and they're always worried about this electrostatic discharge problem so what does this have to do with multi-core well they discovered we don't have to make smaller and smaller cpus at some point they're kind of small enough and so what we need to do is now have more cpus on the same cpu so they create these multi-core cpus dual core then quad core and some people even threw in like three core cpus and then six and eight and well, three and six are basically because they fail on a couple, but that's okay. Anyway, so the idea is you get these multi-core CPUs with multiple different CPUs on the chip. And that is what a multi-core CPU is. It's a CPU with multiple different CPU cores on the chip. So what does it mean when a CPU has hyper-threading? Well, we talked about processes and we talked about threads, basically. The idea with hyperthreading is that your CPU tells the hardware, the rest of the hardware, it has more than one core. <clears throat> so if it's a single core multi or hyperthreaded CPU, then it will tell the computer it might have two CPUs on the chip. And so the computer sends two different processes, one to each one of its virtual CPUs. And then these virtual CPUs both have a little bit of memory and a little bit of other information there. And it only has one actual CPU, but the chip can then switch between them very quickly. And so it simulates two, just switching back and forth very quickly without having to worry about the operating system keeping track of which processes are where. It just sends them both there, and they're both handled without the operating system needing to copy things out of memory and move new things into memory, what it does with other multi multi process type operating system tasks so you can have both a multi core and a hyper threaded cpu so you could have something like a quad core cpu where all of them are hyper threaded so instead of showing up as quad or four it shows up as eight cpus which could be nice it makes it so you can run things faster but in a hyper threading situation you still only have one process running at a time in a multi-core situation you have multiple processes that can actually run simultaneously so then that brings us down to the next thing what is a race condition well a race condition is when you have a situation where the outcome is determined by what happens and what order so I like to think about the ATM example. Say for a moment you have an ATM machine and you want to make a $100 withdrawal from the ATM machine. If you go to the ATM machine, put your card in there and withdraw $100, you get $100 taken off your account and you get $100 that comes out of the machine. But what happens if at the exact same time you are making a withdrawal, you have a direct deposit? Let's say that you have a job, you get $200 deposited into your account. So the question is, well, does it matter what order you process these things in? So what does an AT machine do? Well, first it reads your account balance. It sees if you have the hundred dollars. It takes the hundred dollars, subtracts it from your account, and then it sends you the hundred dollars. Now, the direct deposit might look at your account, figure out how much you have, might add your $200 deposit into your account number and write it back to your account. So what happens if they both read at the same time? So they both find out your account balance. One subtracts $100, one adds $200, and then they both write back. Well, then it matters which one wrote back first as to what your account balance is going to be. So that is a race condition. Obviously, the ideal situation for you would probably be that you withdraw the money at the exact same time the direct deposit goes in, and the direct deposit reads, and then the ATM machine reads, and your direct deposit is the one gets written after the ATM gets written, which means that instead of having a net of $100 more, you'd have a net of $200 more, which would be great. The bank probably not like that, though. Okay. 
How do I know which processes are running? Well, on a Linux machine, you can look at which processes are running. You can actually do it on other machines, too. Pretty much all of them have a way to look at the processes running. And the easiest way to do that is with the ps command. It will show you the processes that are running. You can have processes that are running in the background and processes that are running in the foreground. So a background process is one that runs. It doesn't send out input to you or output to you and things like that. It's just running in the background. A foreground type process is if you have a terminal or something open and you're running a program, you will see um, text printed on your screen. You be typing things. Those are in the foreground. Background, you don't see anything or you rarely see anything. So how do you get into background processes? Well, you can actually pull them to the foreground and you can disconnect output and things like that. And it's all be taken care of. So let's take a look at a machine. So here we have a client machine and I'm going to run the PS command. So if I type PS, I can see these are two commands that are running. The bash command, which is my shell. So my terminal opens up. It's a terminal window. Inside the terminal window, we have this program running that allows me to type in commands and then it runs them. That is my bash shell. And the command I just typed in is PS. And so it says, well, bash is running and PS is running. If I type it again, you can see that bash is running and PS is running. Now, what you might notice is that the process ID number for bash stays the same because it's the same shell. But my PS command is different because I started one command and it printed out the output and then it ended. Then I started the next one, it printed out the output, and it ended. So how do I start a background process? Well, let's try the sleep command. Sleep. If I type in sleep 5, it will wait 5 seconds, and then the command will end, and it will return back to my terminal. I can do sleep 5 ampersand and start as a background process, and it immediately gives me control of my shell again but it's still running. If I press enter again, it says, oh, it's done, by the way. All right, so what if I want to sleep for much longer than that? Let's say I want to sleep for five minutes. I can do sleep 300, and it starts in the background. And you can see there's something here. It also says that there's a process number, 5047. If I type in PS, I can see that 5047 is the sleep command, and it is running. You can also see that my bash is running and my PS is running. If I want to, I can type in jobs. Jobs says that number one is running. I can bring this to the foreground if I want by typing in FG. And that will take the default one, but I can also do FG1 to pull in the number. So now it's running in the foreground. If I want to put it back in the background, I can type in Control Z, which will stop it. So now it's not doing anything. And then I can do a jobs command again to see what it is. And it says, oh, it stopped, by the way. So I can do a BG1 and start it back up again in the background. If I want to end the process, well, I can do that too. But I need to figure out what process I have. So I like PS and I say, oh, okay, my sleep command is 5047. So there are a couple ways to stop the process. One is I can bring it to the foreground and press control C to kill the process, or I can use the kill command. So if we look at the kill command and kill, it says terminate a process. And it says I have to do type the word kill and then I give it some signal number if I want. And then there's a PID number and all these things here. You say, well, that's great. So I can also look at other things like, well, there's a kill two. Oh, that's interesting. Kill two means it's probably tied to the programming language kill. Then I've got things like signal seven, which is probably more informational. So do man seven signal. 
and it says, okay, here's some information about how these signals work. And it says, okay, here are some signals. And you get some information. Oh, okay, so what does it do? Well, if I do a kill, then it's going to send one of these signals. It's going to send this sig term signal over. So the program receives the sig term and it says, oh, it's time for me to terminate. And that works. However, some programs don't like to terminate there because maybe they, they're crashed or something else and they won't terminate. So maybe you need to do it not from telling the program to terminate, but you want to have the operating system itself kill it, which in case you'll do a sig kill, which is number nine. So let's try that. We can see, once again, my sleep command is still running. So I can do kill and 5047 and it says terminated so I do PS and you can see it is gone I think oh I want it back so now I'm going to start it back up again and I do a PS command you can see it's there running it's going to be running for another five minutes I can also do kill minus nine or minus S9 and then the number five two four six and it says killed which is different from what it said previously which was terminated it's terminated and this one is killed so if you're having trouble getting something to stop use the kill command so once again I'm going to start this back up again now I'm going to do a FG to bring it to the foreground and I will press control C to kill it now if I do a PS to see if it's still there, I can see it is not there because I killed the process. So that gives you an idea about starting things in the background and what happens there. So the next big question is, well, what happens if I close the terminal? Well, if you close the terminal, it dies. And it's gone. So that can be a problem. Especially if you log into a server, you start a process in the background and then you log out and suddenly your terminal is gone and the process dies. How do you get that to work? There's a no hop command. So if you do man no hop, what it does is it runs a command immune to hangups with output to a non TTY. So you type in no hop space, the command name, and it runs it in the background without your intervention and you don't really yeah well it kind of keeps running kind of you can still kill it so let's start the sleep command again with a no hop no hop now it says ignore ignoring output or input and appending output to no hop dot out all right so now it's running uh, if i close my window here it will continue running if i do a ps you can still see that it is running so I can still kill it just like I could before. Um, and I can do a jobs and suddenly you see it there. So if I do FG, I can bring it to the foreground and then I can press control C to kill it. Or I could have killed it with the kill command. So I can still kill the process. However, it doesn't, um, it doesn't die when I close my terminal. All right. So back to these questions. How do I start a background process? Just with the ampersand at the end of it. How do I get into a background process? You can go to FG to bring it to the foreground. You can do jobs to get an idea of which process is running in the background. And then what happens when a process, what well, happens to a process when a terminal closes? Well, it dies unless you use something like NoHope to keep it alive. How do I know which processes others are running? Well, other users, who are, who are they and what are they using? How do I know how much resources each process is are using? So how much are they using? And can I end running processes? Well, we know we can end the processes because we saw the kill command. What do I do if the process refuses to die? Just give it a stronger signal. The minus nine is much stronger than the minus 15. So let's figure out what processes are running. So I jump back into my machine here 
And let's take a look at my processes. So I can do PS, and it only shows me my processes. But there's got to be other stuff running. So I do PS AUX. AUX is a bunch of special keywords, key letters. Anyway, it displays this long list of processes running. If I want to have a nice list to look at, I can do pipe through less, and I can scroll through it and see all the different process numbers, what they are, who's running them. You can see there are other users here as well. Well, mostly root, but you know there are, are users here, like the, I don't know, like the, the GDM, which is your, your login manager thing, and color D and, and postfix, which is your mail server. So all these things are running, and some of them have user accounts for it. And at the top, you can see the user running it. You can see the process ID number, the amount of CPU they're using, the amount of memory they're using. And then there's a bunch of other stats here. And the last thing over here is the command that was used to start it. Well, kind of. I mean, it's not always exactly that way. So I can go in and kill any one of these processes with the process ID number. I can also use another command, top. Top is a more active dynamic list of processes running. So you can see which processes are running and what's going on. Uh, it tells you how much memory is being used, uh, the total number of processes, number of running processes, sleeping processes. You can see that most of the processes are sleeping at any given time. That's what they mostly do, is they sleep. And you can see how much you're using, how much um, CPU, how much memory, and you can sort things. We don't really know how they're being sorted right now, but you can use the greater than or less than commands to, or keys to sh shift how it's sorted. So how is it being sorted? Well, if I go all the way over, it's now being reverse sorted by process ID number. And I can go now over to user, then PR, then NI, not, NI is the nice level, so how aggressive it is in running and so that. And ver, res, sure, as CPU. So now it's ordered by the highest CPU down to the lowest CPU. And I can switch over to memory from the highest memory down to the lowest memory. So you can do lots of different things. You can also press other keys, such as K, if I wanted to kill a process. Um, so let's press K and it says well there is this default process some number the one at the top if I kill my gnome shell then that will probably log me out I don't want to kill that one I want to kill the top command so I do five four two seven and it says do I want to use the sig term yeah let's see yeah sure so what happens the top command now ends so that was a quick way to end it right I could have just pressed Q as well, Q to quit out. That's okay. But you can see how this works, and you can see which processes are running on the system and what resources are being used by the one of these processes. What is the proc directory? Well, the proc directory is an interface to the kernel. What does that mean? Well, it's a it's a actually a fake directory. I mean, there's a directory proc, but you have this whole entire file system that includes lots of files that don't really exist. They're not really files. They're just virtual files. And these virtual files have information in there. And some of these pieces of information are things like your CPU information. And what you do when you look at that file is you get information from the CPU, from the kernel. Actually, not CPU, from the kernel. It tells you what what information knows about the CPU. Your memory information shows you about your memory. So all these different things you can look at. So let's go take a look at the proc directory and so we can see. So clear out here. If I go to the proc directory and take a look around, you can see there's a whole bunch of empty files. Well, they're like zero size. So if I look at, let's say I take a look at version right here at the bottom. So version zero byte file so I cat out version and that's clearly not zero bytes but it tells me the version of the kernel running okay 
So I cat out uh, something like zone info. And it says, well, this is some information you might like to know. I'm not sure why I know this, but it's it's all there. Uh, I can then cat out things like my CPU info. CPU info. And it tells me, oh, I've got a couple processors. This one right here is processor zero. It says it is genuine Intel. It tells me about the CPU family. It tells me how fast the CPU runs and all that information. I can also do things like uh, cat out my mem info, which tells me how much memory I have. It tells me my total memory. It tells me how much is available. And it also tells me things like how much swap is being used. Uh, it talks about dirty memory, which is basically memory that is, um, well, it's been loaded into memory, but it has not been written out, so there's no copy of it. And so it cannot be flushed out to swap cleanly. So you have my swap total here, my swap free. All right, so these are all these different memory information pieces. If I look back at the directory ls again, you can see that there are a whole bunch of numbers here. And then there's a bunch of words. Numbers and words. So what are these numbers? Well, let's type in my ps command. You can see that my bash shell, once again, is 4722. So if I go into the 4722 directory and take a look around, you can see there's a bunch of stuff here. And these are different pieces of information. You can see the executable. There's a symbolic link over to my bash. And you got these, um, well, information about your, your process, your CPU things. Um, here right here is the command line that was used to start my process. Um, all kinds of pieces of information you can use, such as your environment. So different things here you can look at, you can mess with. Um, well, you can't mess with a whole lot of it, but so you can, you can mess with. So this information can be useful. And this information is kind of what you get when you run the PS command. You get all of these processes here and information about them. But then there's other directories in here. Things like sys and fs and stuff like that. And they are really kind of what they sound like. Well, let's go into sys and take a look at sys. So you have in here sys. Let's go into net. Now we got IPv4, so let's go into that IPv4. A bunch of things in here. All right, so what do we have? Well, one of these things is a value. So the IP forward thing right here, let's take a look at that. If I cat out IP forward, it says it has a value of one. Well, it could be a value of one, it could be a value of zero. So let's do echo zero into that IP forward. Now, if I cat it out again, it's zero. So you can change the values. And, well, so let's leave it as zero, but let's do a ls minus, minus l ip forward. And you can see that even though I've changed the value, it still has a value or a size of zero. So what I did is just change a kernel value somewhere. ip forward is basically the value that tells your kernel that your computer can run as a router. So why would you want your Linux machine running as a router? In fact, that was the default value. So let's put it back to one. The default value was uh, running as a router. Why would I do that? Well, if you ever want to set up your machine as a NAT box, you're doing your network address translation, or you want to run as a normal router, then you probably want to have that router switch flipped on. So then manually going in here and using the echo command to set it will only set it in active memory. What if you want it to be there on boot time? Well, you can do that too. So let's go down to the etc directory. There is a sysctl command or sysctl command and also a file. So if I cat out sysctl, 
ddl.com. I can see, oh, here we have a bunch of stuff. And if we want to figure out how do we use this, well, we could do look at the man page, man sysctl.com. And it says, okay, well, all you need to do is figure out what you want and uh, put them in here and tell it what you're doing. Okay, well, that's kind of confusing. So what are we doing? It also says you have other files you can look at. There's the etc sysctl.d directory, which has a bunch of comp files. So let's take a look at that one. sysctl.d directory. And you can see there is a 99sysctl.com file. Okay. So it says, all right, we just want to load this one first. Or not first, but after everything else. Because they're in order. And all it says is, well, the sysctl.com file which looked at. So if you wanted to have something start up on boot time, you could use the sysctl.com file to make it happen. So how does that work? Well, the IPE forward command had this long path. So if I do ls minus l, you would proc sys net ipv4 before ip forward. That was the file. Now, everything from sys after sys, this net ipv4 ipv forward is all you, all you need to know about. So I can go into my sys uh, ctl.com file and I just need that part right there net IPv4 IPv4 so go down here and do a net dot IPv4 dot IP forward equals one and that right there will set it up so that when it boots up it will set the IP forward to one well it's already being set to one so I can change this to zero if I wanted but that's how you do it you set values in there. You can also use the sysctl command. Sysctl, how does that work? Well, it says you type in your options and your variables and values and stuff like that. Um, you can do a minus p to read from a file. So I just do sysctl minus p and it sets my net ipv4 ipv4 to 1 because it's reading it from the file, the default file. I can also have other files I read from as well. But that's how you set those. All right. So what other variables are stored in the kernel proc directory? Well, we saw the IV forward. Can I change things? Well, we know the answer to that. You can use the echo, and you can also use the sysctl command. And that brings you to the last question. What is the sysctl command used for? It's for changing those things. All right, file systems. How do I know how much hard drive space is being used? Hmm. That could be important, right? How do I know how much space is used in a directory tree? We can do that too. We'll look at that in a moment. And then what happens when the machine runs out of drive space? I'll tell you, it's very bad things happen. If you think about it, we have a journaling file system. So um, in theory, what would happen if you absolutely ran out of space in order to write something to the hard drive usually you have to write to the journal first say i'm going to make changes to the hard drive and then you make those changes and then you remove your entry from the journal well what happens if the journal takes up extra space then you cannot write to the hard drive in fact there are some file systems that are written so poorly that once the hard drive is completely full if you try to delete a file, it has to write to the journal that's going to delete the file, which it can't do. So it can't delete the file. So the only way to get it clean is to completely reformat the file system. That's a very poor design. So that can be really bad. Don't ever run out of hard drive space. Linux is fortunately written by people who are much more intelligent, and they leave a little bit of buffer space and things like that so that 
you can still do stuff even if you run out of space. Kind of. They kind of run out without actually running out. So how do I get more space? Well, you can delete things. You can add more hard drives. And if you have something like an LVM in there, you can add more hard drives and expand your current drive size and then use your file system tools to expand your file system in your drive space. So let's go look at the file system, see how much space is being used and how we can look at directory trees. So let's jump right in, clear that. If I type in DF, it tells me information about my space being used. Now these 1K blocks are great. We love seeing 1K blocks, but what does that really mean? Well, let's do a DF minus H into a human readable form. It tells me, okay, this is how much space you have. And it rounds these things a little bit, so they're not quite exactly accurate, but you know, it's accurate. All right, you can see which devices I have and then how much space is available on each device. You can see that there really are only two devices that have real space. You have your first one right here, your CentOS root, which is your main file system. And I also have this boot directory. The rest of these are all kind of virtual-ish things. They're not real, really real. They're kind of more memory things that are kind of fakeish. So they don't really count. But those two are real hard drive space. All right. So I know how much space is there. I know how much is left. But what about directories? How much is being used by my, I don't know, my home users? If I look at my home directory, I can see there's a Joseph person there. So if I go down, take a look, I can go into my home directory. I can go into Joseph. I can look around and see how much space is he using? Well, it looks like he's not using very much. How do I find out how much it is? Well, you can sit there and add everything up. Or you have the du command do it. So du, and let's do the home directory. It says, oh, 12 is being used. What's 12? Well, let's once again use the minus h, which happens to be the human readable form. And it says, oh, it's 12k. Like, oh, OK, thank you. What about the user directory? If I do a du minus h on the USR directory, well, that's much larger because it has to go through and parse through all of these directories and figure out how much space is being used in every one and add it all up. And it comes up with a total and says, oh, the entire USR directory is 3.5 gigabytes, more or less. I could do that in less human readable form if I wanted to get more exact numbers. And it'll say, oh, this is the number of blocks being used. These are the 1K blocks. And that's how you can figure out how much space is being used on your system. Anyway, these are, um, that's how you can figure out the space. That's how you can figure out what's in a tree. And once again, don't run out of hard drive space. Bad things happen. And that is the end of this video.